out to the left. Good. All right, so um, I want to thank everyone for being here today. Um, this is the February meeting of the Houston Functional Programming User Group. And today we are really excited to welcome Will Berg, um, who is, uh, he co-created the Minicamera language and uh, co-authored The Reason Steamer. Um, and from what little I know of him is a very nice guy who is really interested in really bad movies. <laughs> um, so, uh, I'm going to turn it over to you, Will. Um, we will record his talk in the first part of the Q&A, and then we will turn off the recording and we'll continue our Q&A. So, Will, it's all yours. All right, thank you. And by the way, since you're in Houston, if you haven't already, uh, maybe you can invite Dan Friedman, because I don't know if you know this, but Dan Friedman actually wrote The Little Lisper when he was in Houston. He was oh. at, he was a faculty member at the LBJ School of uh, Foreign Affairs or whatever International oh. Affairs or something, and that's actually where there. the yeah. little list were. Wait, what was that? I, I, I attended. The, you attended the, that. You attended it. Yeah. When Dan was teaching it, I I don't remember for okay. sure. I okay. do remember. I, yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, that's it's a small world, so uh, yeah, and we have an IUR here, so that's great. Um, that's great. Yeah, so anyway, I you know if if you like this sort of thing, I definitely uh, recommend inviting Dan. So thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm how did you decide to invite me of all people? Uh, I'm just curious. I always you know, usually I get a big head and it's like, oh, my work is well known, and then. They'll they'll usually say something like, "Well, we had a list of three possible speakers, and you're the only one we hadn't ever heard of, so we invited you." So that's that's usually what I hear, right? So I'm just curious. No, but no, if, yeah. Not at all. Um, so um, I certainly know your work, and um, I think I was asking people in the group, like, "Who would you like to hear from?" And I said, "I'm an academic. I am." unashamed and I will ask basically anyone and if they don't want to come they just don't that's respond right. that's fine that's right that's right they'll just ghost you so no and, and 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 no but I think you were one of the first people that we invited for this year um, all right well I, I appreciate it thank you um yes yeah. Who gave the talk about Erlang Timer Wheels? Oh, the Erlang Timer Wheels? You the talk? Oh, um, Jade Allen. Jade, yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. She, she, she yeah. suggested it? Okay. Okay. Oh, okay. So it was, a, it was the previous organizer of this group who oh, awesome. suggested your name. Yeah. All right. Well, thank, well, thank you very much. Uh, I gave a talk in Japan once. I gave a keynote at a conference where all my papers had been rejected. <laughs> and I thought, well, finally, I've made it, right? And then, uh, you know, I asked later, it's like, oh, yeah, why'd you invite me? He's like, yeah, you're the only speaker we hadn't heard of or, or the only work we didn't know about. It's like, okay, well, you know, hey, that's actually that's actually a pretty good algorithm, right? If you're going to invite people, to invite the people where you don't know about it. So, um, I, you know, I, I, that stung a little bit the first, first few times I heard that answer. But then it's like, actually, that's a great strategy, I think. So uh, thank you. Well, if you'd like us to tell you we hadn't heard of you. Yeah, you know, I mean, okay, so. Your ego. Yeah, <laughs> yeah a, funny, a funny thing happens because, because originally when I started working on Mini Canron and the relational programming stuff, even before there was a Mini Canron when there was Canron, and then we started working on the book, eventually when the, the first edition of the book came out in 2005, you know, it was Friedman... Or no, it was Bird Kesselyoff Friedman, I think. I forget the, the order. I think that was it. And everyone's like, Dan and Oleg have a book. <laughs> you know, And that happened for like 10 years. And now it's, oh, Will Bird created Mini Kendra. And it's like, no, you know, neither one's exactly true. But um, that's just kind of the way things happen. If you work on something a long time, people sort of give you um, more credit than you deserve. At this point, there have been a lot of people who've worked on 
on some variant of this work and too more too many people for me to think individually but it's been about 20 years now since we started working on the McKinley um all right well okay so I saw that this this goes you have like a two-hour block and speakers go from 30 minutes to whenever you know I I have a bad habit like I'll talk the whole time so I'll talk for 20 40 hours. I have talked for 40 hours for on Mini Kenwin. So, you know, I think it's more like, what do you all want to do? I'm kind of in a chill mood. I'm happy to be interactive and I can show you some things and we can have some discussion or I can give you a typical demo or I can talk to you about, you know, why Mini Kenwin sucks and we need a new version, whatever you want. But uh, I guess part of it is some people might not be familiar with logic programming or relational programming or constraint logic programming. So I could start with just kind of, you know, my my high level take on what those things are. But on the other hand, maybe people, you know, are, are somewhat familiar with that. So, um, so, I, so I definitely, I definitely think jumping in and speaking over Jared, oh, <laughs> that an introduction would be excellent, okay, and then go into but questions because there are. I would people. like to know why it sucks. That is, that's a real okay. thing. Yes. <laughs> well, you know, all languages suck, right? It's, it's sort of like uh, in physics, you know, all models are wrong. Some models are useful. And, you know, there's like the two classes of programming languages, the ones that, uh, you know, people complain about and the ones no one uses, um, you know, that type of thing. So, uh, okay, well, sure. I'm happy to give you a demo. So I, I promised to talk on you know, sort of what comes next or a next generation of language. And and I'll be honest that, you know, I, I'm still in the ideation phase, so I could talk to you about why Mini Kenwin sucks, and so do all the other languages that are trying to do this, and, you know, how I can imagine a language that might suck less, but it'll still probably suck a lot. Um, but, you know, maybe we can incrementally get towards a suck less language. Uh, so I, I'm happy to talk about that after I give the intro and I know there's a wide variety of, of experience with you know, uh, logic, constraint logic, programming, mini Kenrin and so forth. So some people may have implemented mini Kenrin and some people you know, maybe haven't heard of it before. So um, that always makes it interesting. I'll, I'll give a demo and I'll talk about kind of the high level philosophy of what this style of programming is like. So this is the functional, you know, it's funny to me that uh, in the functional community, uh, I'm, I'm known for not doing functional programming, basically. I mean, we, we have a functional implementation of a constraint logic language, but, you know, at, at some point we took over about half of the scheme workshop. Half the scheme workshop papers were on mini -can. <laughs> And it's like, maybe it's time to have our own workshop because it's kind of like, well, when everything's constraint logic programming, is it really the scheme workshop at that point? Mm -hmm. All right. Let us... Uh... I do some screen sharing here. All right. <clears throat> okay, so here's my uh, usual sp spiel talking about what is what I call relational programming um, as opposed to functional uh, programming. So, you know, I'll just give you, let's just do that. Okay, what is relational programming? And you know, you can sort of think constraint logic programming if you're familiar with those terms. And how does it differ? From functional programming. Okay, so we all know and love functional programming, maybe. Um and so functional programming is based on a great idea. Now, now, there's a lot of debate, actually, on what functional programming is. If you ask Bob Harper what functional programming is, he'll say scheme programs aren't even, but not only are that functional programs, they're not even programs, OK? They're like fragments of syntax, OK? Uh, I reject Bob's worldview Ooh. and replace it with my own. OK, so, uh, but in any case, if we think about what the idea of functional programming is, the, the part of the idea is that say we have a notion of like addition and we might say in scheme syntax or racket syntax or lisp syntax 
we want to add three and four, and that expression on the left would evaluate to seven, and we would say plus is a procedure or a function. Let's say let's say it's a function that can take two, uh, let's say non-negative integers and and sum them, and so the result of calling this function is a value which is seven. Okay, so so here we have the notion of a function. And we also have the notion of input. And we have the notion of output. OK. So um, this, this dichotomy or this difference between input and output is really critical. And, and we're just so used to it that I think most of the time we don't think about it. Um, but. I'll claim to be provocative that this is actually a really bad thing. That functional programming is really bad. We should all feel ashamed. We should feel bad for doing it, for advocating it. It's really bad because functions, uh, you know, that's that's a very uh, poor way of looking at the world. And what you really should think of is relations. So we should think that instead of this this false dichotomy between input and output. Instead, we should say, well, we actually have a triple, I'll call it plus O, that's just our convention in Minikanrin, and we have a three-place relation. Okay, and there is no difference between inputs and outputs. That concept is gone, all right? It's sort of like if you talk to the small talk people. You know, Dan, Dan Engels says that the idea of an operating system is a bad idea. There shouldn't be an operating system. An operating system is all the junk that you can't put anywhere else, okay? And in small talk, they don't have an operating system. It's just objects in a virtual machine. So in the same way, I will claim, whether or not I actually believe this, I will, uh, I, I will remain silent, but I'll claim that functions are bad. Functional programming is a bad idea. We need to move past it, okay? so. If we want to get to higher levels of abstraction, we need to talk about relations. Okay, so why why are relations interesting? Relations are interesting because they're very flexible. Because in addition to the notion of a relation, we are going to think of in terms of like an algebra, okay, and algebraic reasoning. If there are any Haskellers out there, uh, you know, close your ears. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but but anyway, you know, so we're going to talk about sort of like middle school or high school algebra. Okay, we're not talking about like uh, you know Haskell algebra. Although maybe I think there's certainly a lot of algebraic um, reasoning here. But the idea is that we can have unknowns represented as variables. Okay, so if we can say something. Like with our four place relation, um, you know, plus O, three, four, seven, we could replace, if we wanted to, that third position, that third argument with a variable that represents an unknown quantity. And then we can ask a query, and the system somehow will figure out that Z is equal to seven. And so that will give us a solution in terms of equations or disequations or constraints in general. So, so uh, now we can ask uh, these sorts of questions and ask queries. You know, set up set up constraints and relationships and and ask queries. So, and we could just as easily do something like say, hey, maybe we don't know what y is. You know, tell me what y is. Or more interestingly. We could say something like, we don't know what X and, and Y are together as a pair and tell me what those values are. And now you're saying things like, well, if X is zero, you know, Y is seven. And you also can say that if X is one, you know, Y is two. And uh, in this case, they're finitely many if we restrict ourselves to uh, natural numbers. But if we relax this and said all the integers, uh, now there'd be infinitely many solutions. So so now we're in a space where we're talking about not just one answer and not just functions that have inputs mapping to outputs, but we have relations and we have placeholders 
And now we have a solver and we can ask queries and solve over um, these sets of constraints that we're building up and let the underlying computational system do uh, sort of the handiwork and the dirty work of figuring out what those assignments are. And it's very similar to, you know, solve for X or solve for X and Y in say a high school algebra problem. So that is, is the high level idea, okay? So we're trying to uh, get additional flexibility. And so we have additional abstraction in several ways. So first of all, we've removed the idea of input versus output. That is uh, not necessary. It, it's not a necessary idea. And uh, you know we, we're more abstract by removing it. Instead, there's relationships. And you can, by the way, map this very directly to databases and database tables, right? It's like, instead, now we can think of the table of X, Y, Z values that satisfy this relation. And you know, the table could be finite, the table could be infinite. If the table's infinite, then we're gonna have to generate the table lazily. If it's finite, then we could write out all the table uh, beforehand if we want. And now when we're building up a, a program that's represented by a bunch of constraints, now you can think of that as doing joins over these tables, which could all be infinite potentially. And so you have to do a lazy part of the computation. So it's abstract in, in a way that we claim that functional programming isn't and goes beyond functional programming in some ways. And uh, we now are playing these sort of algebra tricks. And there are some other interesting properties. So I will try to make this a little more uh, concrete. So I'm not going to show you numbers because, okay, one of the good and bad things about Mini Canron, it's like, oh, I want to create a, a program synthesis system for a Turing complete language that supports recursion and symbolic, uh, you know, list-based manipulation. No problem, easy. I want to add two numbers. I want to add two integers or two natural numbers. Like, okay, sit down, calm down, and we're going to have to have a have a have a talk. Okay, so that's one of the trade-offs right now with Mini Canron. Uh, so I'm not going to show you this because it turns out that that this example, which while it's easy to explain, is actually uh, quite tricky to implement in Mini Canron. And I mean, we did have, we have ways to do it, but we have many ways to do it. So that's not necessarily a good thing. So sort of first chink in the armor, if you want to think of it that way. Well, okay, so let's load up. Okay. And the hello world of functional programming is, of course, what? Hello world. What, what's the hello world of functional programming? Do you know? Talk about it's, it's, it's <laughs> factorial. Factorial is the hello world of functional programming. If you really want to go wild, you can do Fibonacci, but usually factorial is like the hello world. Okay. So here, the hello world for constraint logic programming or relational programming is a pen or a concat or whatever. So in good old scheme, we can do things like, hey, schemes get symbols and lists so we can append the list abc to the list de and we get abcde okay great so that is the functional version we have concatenated these two lists to get uh, another list so we have clear inputs okay and we have a clear output all right now we're going to do the similar thing in mini canron and i'm going to define appendo um doo -doo -doo. Okay, so let's do, how about L, S, and L, S? That's the concatenation of L and S. And I'm not going to get into all the details of how many canon works. I mean, we can backtrack and I can explain exactly how this works if you want. I'm just trying to paint the big idea right now. So, so excuse me for, you know, just kind of uh, sketching over this, but... Um, I mean, I'll explain at a high level what's going on. So, so basically, we're saying that appendo is a relation that we're representing in scheme, which is the host language um, 
for which many canrooms extending. Appendo is a three-place relation. It has two lists, L and S, and LS, the third argument, is the concatenation of L and S. Okay, I don't I don't want to talk about in terms of inputs and outputs. I'm just talking about their positions. Condi allows us to make a choice. So we're going to have two Condi clauses. So they're two different choices. Either the, if the first list is empty, then it turns out that the second and third lists are the same list. There's equal equals. That's a type of equality based on an operation called unification or technically first order syntactic unification. There are many types of unification, it turns out. And uh, we can also introduce temporary logic variables. So these variables that are like placeholder things where you can do algebra over, these are what are called logic variables. So Fresh allows me to introduce some logic variables. And so I can say L might be a cons of say A and um, D, that's the car and the cutter to schemers or lispers. And we'll say that LS is the cons of A and the res. And then we're going to do a recursion, do a recursive call to appendo on D S to res. Okay. So some of these elements, if you're familiar with functional programming, you should be aware of. Okay, so you probably know what lambda is, right? This is a lambda takes three arguments. This condi is kind of like cond in Lisp or Scheme, which is McCar McCarthy's cond operator. It allows you to make a choice. So it's like kind of like an if, okay? It's like a conditional. The difference is in a relational setup, we try all possible choices, not just the first one that has a special guard or a special test. Okay, so all the all the choices could be tried and could produce answers. Fresh has two purposes. It's going to introduce some of these variables that we've looked at before. In the addition example, there are these like logic variables that we can do algebra over. And then here we're, we're both destructure destructuring L, saying, hey, L L's got to be a pair, and we're calling the the head of the pair A and the tail of the, you know, the the pair D. Okay, that's one way to look at it. Or L itself coming in could be one of these logic variables that we do algebra over. In which case, and it may not even have any structure. Maybe it doesn't have any value associated with it. So this is a big change. In this world, we are allowed to do operations on variables that we don't know anything about. Okay. It's not not like we're going to get an error um, when we operate on these variables. It's just that when we perform operations involving those variables, we might give those variables more structure or even completely ground their values, or we might find out whatever operations we're doing with those variables is inconsistent, and then our entire computation can fail through inconsistency. So here we're saying L, which is which could be a logic variable representing that, that you know, with structure we don't know, well, it's got to be a pair. And the pair, uh, you know, it's got to be a pair of A and D. Since A and D were just introduced at this point, we know that they don't have any values associated with them. Um, but then over time, like in the recursion, you know, D might get structure. Or because LS might have structure coming in, the fact that we're associating A with LS, you know, maybe A gets structure. So um, there's this whole game where we can accumulate information over time in different ways. And the point is, we don't care if L already has structure or not coming in uh, to a call to a pendo, and we don't care if S or LS have structure. This program will work if they're fully ground and have concrete values for everything, or if there's no information at all about LS and LS. Okay, so we're allowed to reason more abstractly. Okay, so that is um, a simple mini Kendron relation, sort of the hello world of, of constraint logic programming. And now we're going to do what's called a run. So like I said, mini Kendron's embedded in a host language normally. Scheme, Racket, you know, it could be in Haskell, it could be in Clojure, uh, like CoreLogic, or it could be o OCaml, like uh, OCanron, whatever. Um, could be Java. So we are going to use this run interface operator to act as an intermediary 
between our host language, which is Scheme in this case, and Mini Cameron. Because Scheme doesn't know about logic variables. Scheme doesn't know about, you know, Condi or Fresh or any of those things. Um, obviously, there's some magic behind the scenes, which I'll I'll show you a little of. Um, but we need somehow a way to talk to, to Scheme so we can write our regular Scheme code and we can also write our regular mini Canron code. They kind of exist in two different worlds, but they they can send, you know, they can interact in a way. Okay, so here, uh, the run, we say we want one answer back if, if it exists. And Q is what we call our query variable. So whatever the value associated with Q, that's what we're going to see at the end of the computation. And now we can call appendo. We could do our similar, you know, like we do something like our first example. But now I can I can put Q or query variable in that third position of appendo. And let's see what happens. All right. So what we get back is a list containing one list. Okay. It's not the list ABCDE. It's the list containing the list ABCDE. That's important. All right. So here we've appended these two lists or concatenated the two lists and got back what we expected. Okay. That would be kind of boring, except now we can play this game where we can put a list in that third position. Actually, we can run a computation right now and we get back this kind of strange looking value list containing underscore dot zero. Underscore dot zero is a representation of a of one of these uh, query variables not being associated with any concrete value. It means that Q could be anything. You can think of this in logic like an existential. Well, this is sort of like saying, or actually in this case, you can almost think of like a universal. It's sort of like saying for all Q, for any value of Q, it is the case that appending ABC to DE gives you ABC DE. That'd be one way to think about it. Uh, but we can also put the Q in other places like right here. Okay, so now we've changed the meaning of this query. So now we're asking, for what value of Q is it true that appending the list ABC to Q gives you the list ABCDE? In this case, it's pretty clear that it, that would be the list DE. Q would be the list DE. So we're seeing what value is associated with Q. Um, now, more interestingly, we can have multiple uh, query variables. So we could say, Okay, for which values of X and Y is it true that appending X and Y gives us the list ABCDE? And now we see that we have a list containing a list containing two lists. And we have a little more, more structure because now we have two uh, query variables. But the main point is that X is going to be the empty list in the first answer, and Y is going to be the list ABCDE. And we can ask for a second answer. And in this case, uh, we get two results back. And in the second case, X is the list A and Y is the list B, C, D, E. We could ask for six answers. We could ask for a bunch of answers. We could ask for all the answers with what's called a run star. So instead of putting in a number, run star just says, give me everything. Okay, in this case, there's six answers that we get. We could also play slightly more advanced schemes. So for example, uh, I could say, well, how about this? How about I have a list? I'm gonna change it to one. How about we have a list? Oh, uh, just to, I, okay. I had a quick question. Sure. What happens uh, if, if there's no solution? So I, I think you showed what happened when there was like exactly- mm. Okay. What, when, anything is the solution, but I was just kind of curious what happens if there's sure. no solution. Well, let, let's make a simple one. How about, how about we say A to B is ABC, okay? Do you, do you agree that there shouldn't be a solution to that one? If yes. we concatenate A to B, we get ABC. And sure enough, what we get back is the empty list of, of answers. Okay, that's a good question. And, and I'll show you one other case, which is, you know, we can also do this. We could say X, Y, Z. Okay, now what do we get back? You know, what do you think you, we should get back in this case? All the lists. All the lists. Well, okay. So yeah. this is interesting. This is interesting. So notice I last I asked for a run one. Yeah. Okay. Well, we got all the lists. 
You only get one random result. You get all possible lists, but you don't get them. You don't get them. Let's see, let's see what we get. Okay, so here's what we have. We get we get a, a somewhat abstract answer that basically is saying if X is the empty list and Y is anything, then Z is the same thing as Y. We've tied together the values of Y and Z. We've represented infinitely many concrete values using one somewhat abstract value. But this isn't a completely abstract value because we still say that X has to be the empty list. Okay, So this is an interesting answer because it's sort of a combination of an abstraction and also concrete. The other thing you might notice, well, is there any constraint saying that Y has to be a list? Hmm. Maybe Y doesn't have to be a list. And in fact, if we go back to the scheme, I don't know if you knew this. Is that legal in the scheme? I know all the MLers and Haskellers are going to tell me whether that's just, that should be legal. <clears throat> that works just fine in scheme. Okay, that's legal. Well, that that's good taste. I don't know. Okay, but we we copied sort of the semantics of scheme. So there actually is no restriction that Y and Z have to be lists in this case. All right, so we're copying the, the weird scheme semantics where we can have an improper list, um, basically. Okay, so shooting is a const. What, what is that? So shooting is a const error, basically. Uh, sorry, what's a const error? Also, yeah, so it's basically treating it as a const error. Like when you cons two items, like two items together. Yeah, that's right, yeah, this is, you know, I, I could do a simple, I mean, probably the simplest example, you know, I could do like that, right? Mm. And so that that's just the same same as consing put eight on to five. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So so you're allowed to have improper lists as a result of a pen in the scheme. Um now now if I and if I if I really want to prove that to you, by the way, uh, I could let's see. Um Oops. I've been learning Dvorak on the fancy Kinesis thing, and I can't type at all. And so now this is my first time to type it on a real keyboard in ages. All right, here we go. Uh, so yeah, now what I could do is I can, I can do a conjunction, so I can actually add another constraint saying that y is five. Okay. So now what do you think we'll see? List five, and then into list item current five. Is that what you expected? That's what we could have expected given yeah. the, given what we saw. Cool. Yeah. Also, yeah. 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 Close. yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Now, okay, so here is something that I think is cool. And as far as I know, I'll, I'll claim you can't do this in Haskell or ML or Scheme, okay, in general. I can do this. I can reorder the conjuncts, okay? So I have constraints that are in a conjunction. There's an implicit and, if you want to think of it that way, um, inside of the run, or I can make it explicit that turns out that fresh, which introduces these uh, new logic variables that are lexically, locally lexically scoped, that's also like an and. Okay, so this is like an and or a conjunction. I can reorder those things and preserve the semantics. And that's true in general. There is a caveat. So I'll, I'll tell you the caveat in a few minutes, but I'm allowed to reorder things. And if I go back to the definition of appendo, wherever that is, here we go. I, I can, you know, okay, so here we have within a condi clause, this is a conjunction, this is an and. I can swap those two. Okay. I am allowed to swap those. I can swap those two. I can swap this. I can move these things around. I can even take the two condi clauses, which are like an or, and swap those around. Okay, so I, I can play all these games. I, I can also, 
you know, go within a single equal equal and swap the arguments there. Okay. I can do all those things. And if I uh, run my program, I still get the same behavior. Try that in Haskell. <laughs> okay. So, you know, in some sense, this is this is a more abstract model. Now, it turns out that there's a little problem. <laughs> you know, there's always a catch, right? So the catch is, remember before I did a run star? Let's try that again. It's like, I want to get all the answers back, right? Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Why didn't it terminate? I could do a run six. Okay, there's six answers. Great. What if I do a run seven? Uh-oh. Infinite loop. Now, why is that? If we go back to our appendo, I, I was swapping things around with wild abandon. It is true I can swap all these things around, and they logically are equivalent as long as an answer exists. So Mini Canron uses what's called a complete interleaving search. If an answer exists, if you had unbounded amounts of time in memory, you would find the answer with the Mini Canron search. This is not true of the default prologue search, by example. Uh, for example, if you're familiar with that, prologue uses a depth first search, which is incomplete. And there are certain cases where it could search forever and never find a, an answer that exists. And Mini Canron, in theory, uh, Mini Canron would always, the search would always find the result. However, um, if an answer doesn't exist, if there is no answer, it's no, there's no guarantee that Mini Canron can find it. Um, now, part of this comes down to the halting problem, and part of this comes down to many can using search that's not very smart. If a programmer has insight into the problem, there are tricks they can use to, to try to get better refutational behavior. But in this, problem, uh, this program, the core of the issue is this recursive call coming at the beginning of a conjunction. The problem isn't that we swapped the two condi clauses, the or part, or that we swap these two unifications. The problem is that this, this um, recursive call is coming first, and Mini Canron executes within a single conjunction. Mini Canron executes the goals in order from sort of top down. So the problem is there might not be an answer, which means that one of these equality constraints or unification constraints might fail. But the problem is the, the failing might happen after this recursive call. And if you look, the, the D and the res are fresh. They just got introduced. They don't have any value yet. So D and res are fresh at this call. S might also be fresh. Um, even if, if, even if, F, uh, if S isn't fresh, you still have the problem that you're going to keep entering this con D with the first clause, trying this recursion. It's just going to keep trying to do the recursion forever, looking for an answer that doesn't exist. If the answers exist, like those six answers that exist, and we only ask for six answers, then it works just fine. Okay. The problem is we don't have refutational completeness. We have completeness. The search will find answers that exist if there's enough you know, memory and, and enough computation, but uh, it might not ever be able to figure out or prove that an answer doesn't exist. Now, in this case, it's relatively easy to fix the problem because we can just put the appendo at the end. And now if I try this again, it terminates. Okay. But the problem is in a more complicated program, you might have multiple recursive calls or multiple calls to helpers that are recursive, and you can't put them all last. Okay. And in and, and, and those sorts of cases, it will depend on whether or not one of these arguments coming in is a logic variable or whether that's ground as to whether or not you get reputational completeness. So this is the Achilles heel of Turing complete logic programming. You know, this is true in Prolog, true in Mini Cameron, true in other systems. And this is why Bob Harper claims that logic programming is not declarative. And there is, there is an argument to be made there. And I, I understand what he means by that. Um, so it you know logic programming doesn't live up to what you would hope it would do uh, because of this problem.
Okay, so this this is sort of the first Achilles heel. heel. Now I will show you just kind of one more cool thing with a pen, because I, I think or a pendo, because I think I think it's worth seeing. Um, you know, we can also write things like this. Okay, so we can partially instantiate arguments. Okay, so so you know, first argument now is the list A B followed by anything else that we call X. And and that works. And I can do a run star and get all the all the results. Okay, so so it's a very flexible paradigm from that standpoint. However, you know, there there are some trade-offs. Now I can show you uh, all sorts of other things. I can show you client generation and relational interpreters and you know, kind of our, our standard things in Barlaman. I've also given a lot of talks on this stuff, and some people may have already seen those. So, you know, I I don't know if you want me to do my usual dog and pony show, or if you want to talk a little bit about things, or if uh, you know, at what point you want me to talk about um, ideas for, you know. Uh, maybe how to go go beyond some of the problems. So, what what do you think uh, what people would like? Should, we, should I keep showing more? I guess we got what an hour left. I'm still curious why it sucks. So, <laughs> Jared, Jared wants to know about the suckiness. Is, is it just that Achilles heel, or is or is there well, more? I mean, no, no, there's definitely more. <laughs> That's part of it. <laughs> you know, so so part of okay. So let's let's talk about some other issues. <clears throat> Um, yeah, so like I didn't even tell you the good parts in some sense, right? You just kind of have to believe me, but I've you know given lots of talks. You know, I, I wrote I made this talk called The Most Beautiful Program Ever Made, it's like the success of clickbait titles. So if you want, you could watch that talk and I show kind of what happens when you write an interpreter for a scheme in this style and all sorts of cool games you can play. Actually, let me just show you one thing about that one first, okay? Just so that we can, you know, I'll, I'll do it quickly, okay? I'm not going to get into all the details, um, but I think this is probably worth seeing because um, otherwise I think you might not appreciate kind of the, the full interesting part of it and the full kind of, wow, this is uh, going to be tricky to make it suck less. So... I just loaded an interpreter for scheme written in in Mini Um I usually show client generation. I'm not going to do it this time. I'm just going to show um, one more example. Uh, so so in scheme, like I'm using a shape scheme right now, there is the ability to do this code data isomorphism. People call it right. So you know I can do things like uh, plus three four. That was what I was talking about before. Evaluates the seven, but I can use this quote thing. And now that expression <clears throat> evaluates to the list plus three, four. Okay. And I can manipulate that list just like a list. I can pick the first thing in it and I get plus, for example. Okay. So it's not, um, it's not actually uh, the procedure that knows how to do addition. It is like literally the symbol plus, but I can call this eval function. And I can take something like the quoted plus that just the symbol plus, and I can get my hands onto the procedure that it's associated with, or I can eval the quoted plus three, four of that list, and I can get my hands on the seven. And just to make it a little more clear, like I can set, define list to be quote plus three, four. Okay, so I'm really not cheating here. This is list. I can ask, is ls a list? Yes, it is. Okay, what's the length of it? It's really a list of length three. Let me eval ls, and I get back seven. Okay, so scheme has this eval mechanism, it has this quote mechanism, and they they sort of are yin and yang in a way. Um, okay, so that's very, very cool and very powerful. I can also quote like lambda expressions and all that. Back less. Well, we are going to write our own eval in Scheme, or more to the point, I've written an eval in Scheme and uh, with other people. And so we are going to, just like we call Dependo, we're going to call Evalo in the relational setting. So I can say run one, run one Q, Evalo, 
And so the Valen scheme takes an expression and then evaluates it and gives you back a value. Here, we, of course, are playing this relational game. So we don't talk about inputs and outputs. Instead, we have some expression and some value that's related to the expression. So I can give an expression like uh, you know, cons three, four, and then Q is the value of that expression. And I get the, the pair of three dot four, fine. Now, the interesting thing is the, the interpreter that I've written or with, with other folks, this Avalo thing, uh, it supports a fair amount of scheme actually. Mm -hmm. And so it even supports like racket style pattern matching and so forth. So I can do things like write a let rec. This is a recursive uh, form and I can write scheme append. Okay, this isn't appendo in Minicanron, this is scheme append. And I could say, okay, we're back in the horrible functional setting where there's inputs and outputs. So we have two inputs. And I'm gonna say, if L is the empty list, we're gonna return S. Otherwise we're going to cons the first thing in L onto the recursion of the rest of L. Let's see, I you know, hope my little thing is not blocking. Okay, there we go. The rest of L uh, to S. Okay, so that's that is uh, the definition of append. And then inside the let rec, I can make a call to append, like append A, B, C to D, E. <clears throat> okay, so this whole let rec expression is just a scheme expression. I can literally just take this and run that in scheme, and it will give me the list A, B, C, D, E. But I'm running this within the context of an evalo. That's the relational version of the evaluator. And I'm doing a run one queue. Maybe I can, maybe this makes a little more clear. I can say I want to know what the value of that expression is in scheme. Okay, so val is my query variable and I should get back the value of that expression. And sure enough, I get a list containing the list A, B, C, D, E. All right, fine. But the part that's more interesting is that then I can say, oh, okay, so I want A, B, C, D, E, let's say, to be my value. Now I can say, well, huh, maybe I can put, you know, an expression E, within this call to append. So I'm appending some expression E to the list DE to get A, B, C, D, E. I want to know what the E could be. And so, okay, E, e could be the list that you back from the expression, actually, quote A, B, C, all right? Now I could ask for a second expression. Now, may, you know, should there be anything else or is that it? Is there anything other than list A, B, C? Yeah, list of A. Let's see. Because here's what I'm thinking. You could maybe have a list of a container of A, B, and C, D, like a, a list containing two lists, and maybe try to record them you know, through that way. That. Well, okay. So I don't know if this is good, what you're getting at, but the key thing here is. E is actually an expression, not a list. It's not a value, it's an expression, okay? So we are getting back expressions that if you evaluate them, give you the list ABC. So like, here's one. This is a little hard to read maybe, but if I just run this in scheme, sure enough, it gives you back the list ABC. What this is saying is this is a Lambda of that there's like a var args Lambda applied with zero arguments and it evaluates the list ABC. So basically, Mini Canron is doing program synthesis to find expressions, and they're inflating many of those, that when you evaluate them, give you back the list ABC. Now, if I put a quote in front of that expression, then there's only the quoted list, only quoted values. In that case, there's only the quoted list ABC. Okay, but it allows us to start playing playing uh, program synthesis games. And I can also do things like this. I could say, well, you know, uh, what about this car, cons of car L, you know, could I replace that with an expression? Okay. 
And sure enough, I can. So now I'm actually starting to do real program synthesis is where I can start synthesizing parts of the definition of append from an input output example. And we push this a fair amount. We've got a tool called Barlamin where we can synthesize all of append from input output examples, that kind of thing. Um, so, you know, that's kind of the, the most interesting example we have. And um, now why does that suck? Okay. Well, that part doesn't suck. That part's awesome. <laughs> okay. That's, that's the cool part of it. That part. Like, that this, was doesn't, pretty awesome. this doesn't seem to suck. That's the yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. So that part doesn't suck, but uh, <laughs> okay, fine. If you, you think that doesn't suck, I guess I'll just show you, uh, let me show you one other thing and see if I can get away with showing this. Uh, I'll see if this works. Um, yeah, maybe this works. Okay, so I'll, just, I'll try one more time. Uh, see if I can. I don't know if you all be able to see this. Like, if I zoom in, can you see me zooming in or not? Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah. You can. So, yeah. so okay, so it gets like it zooms in like that. Yeah, yes. Oh, cool. All right. Well, then this is probably easier to read then. Okay, so this is this Barlamin tool that I worked on because I, was, I got tired of trying to tell a Java programmer who asked me what I do, like, you know, how do I explain to them? I always like give them a three hour tutorial on the Lambda calculus or whatever. So I thought, you know, it's actually better to just kind of put an interface over what I was just showing you. Um, so I created this Barlamin tool and then Greg Rosenblatt made it much faster. But the idea here is we can have a program skeleton. Um, so, this is part of a program, but it doesn't have a whole lot, right? We're just defining some procedure, but you know, we don't know what the name is. That that comma a means that's like a logic variable. Okay? This whole thing is quasi quoted, if you know Lisp. Um, we don't know what, how many arguments the function takes, and we don't know what the body of the function is. So we don't know a whole lot about it. But what I could do is start giving examples. So you know, here's our buddy append again, and so I could say input and output example. You know, append empty list, the empty list gives you the empty list. And now here, the system tries to fill in um, the values of those logic variables based on that relational interpreter I was showing you, the behavior with optimizations or, or with uh, heuristics to help make it faster. And so here it says, okay, the best guess is that the function's called append. And well, it could be variadic. It, it could take any number of arguments and it returns the empty list. Okay, it's a static function. It was like, well, that is true that that matched my example, so it's not wrong. You know, it's like, prove me wrong, you know? You only gave me one example, so that's fine. So we can try giving another example. So maybe like list A to list B should be uh, list A, B. And it'll, it'll think a little bit. And so, so now it's got a more complicated program it came up with. Now it takes two arguments. We don't know what the arguments are called. Um, and now it came up with a condition, so an if. So if the second argument is the empty list, return it. Otherwise, return the list A, B. Okay, so it's sort of over-specializing. But I can go in here and I can also edit things. Like I, I might say, hey, you know, let's call the arguments like X and Y, okay? Um, and now you can see that, okay, these arguments are, are now referred to uh, as X and Y. So I can, you know, do this sort of editing all I want. I could also, if I wanted to, um, do something a little, a little uh, more generic. So here you could see it's over specializing to the A and B because those were in the example. Um, but if I want to, I can use uh, these sort of abstract, abstract values instead of A and B. Um, but in this case, what I'll do is I'll, I'll use another trick, which I'll say like I'll just do. Uh, another example with two different concrete values. Um, and so that gives me C and D. Okay, so at this point, you know, it could come up with nested ifs or whatever, but it's actually, uh, it, it finds more quickly this um, this version that doesn't specialize on the exact uh, symbols anymore. So you're, you're not seeing A and B there. But it hasn't figured out the whole thing because it hasn't figured out the recursion. So... I can try giving it one more test. How about uh, EF uh, to GH? Um, now, 
given that I'm doing a Zoom call, you know, this might take a minute. So I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, but you can you can kind of see what's going on here where we're doing input output based uh, program synthesis. <clears throat> now, okay, well, yeah, it came up with it in uh, what, 11.6 seconds. Okay, so here's the got the recursive call. So that is the correct definition of a pen actually. Okay, now uh, this already shows though a couple of problems. Um, I mean, one, well, I, I don't I don't know if this the demo shows it, but uh, there are problems latent here. Okay, so one problem is if I take that first base case and move it last, I don't know what's going to happen. This might it might come back in you know uh, twenty seconds, or it might come back in a million years. I don't I really don't know. Uh, certainly, if I reverse the order of these input output examples, the amount of time it takes is going to increase you know probably exponentially so there is a dependency because of that conjunction problem i was talking about um you know this sort of programming is highly sensitive to the ordering in, in the conjunction the ordering of those goals in the conjunction and it's also uh, sensitive to the ordering of the disjunctions as well although i think that's not as critical um so so this is sorry yeah, that, sure. so, so is that I mean I guess this is what you're getting to of, of where there are problems so so this is is this part of what you're trying to solve or, or this is just a limitation of how it was implemented okay well I think okay so that's a good question all right um I'm actually going to <laughs> for my computer melt cycle. <laughs> I'm not actually that curious about how long it will take uh, you know, a million years or a billion years. It's all the same to me. That'd be a spectacular presentation. <laughs> yeah, come back in a million years and we'll see if it made progress. Um, okay, so that that's I think that's the right question, right? So one of the things that has made Mini Kenrin a success, th there are a couple things. One is that the implementation is very small. And in particular, Jason Heeman and Dan Friedman have a paper on what they call micro -canron, And that's about 50 lines of scheme code. And now everyone who gets into mini canron ends up implementing a micro -canron, right? So it's like kind of like scheme. Everyone gets in the scheme, implements his little scheme interpreter, or maybe a compiler, right? It's so the same with mini canron. Everyone who gets into mini canron ends up implementing one. Um, <clears throat> And you know that implementation ended up in the second edition of the Reason Schemer, uh, and that's great. And so that's kind of one of the things that Minikanran is known for. And in particular, there's this higher order representation of streams. So there are procedures or functions that imp implement streams, which are you know basically lazy, potentially infinite lists, which are how we do all of this, you know, magic with. You know, how do you have infinitely uh, large tables? Well, we actually have streams filling in the computation and we can pull from the streams. And so all the search and all the laying is, is, is from streams. But while that is awesome, that also is awesome. Uh, and the default search in many ways is pretty awesome. This interleaving search strategy that uh, this complete interleaving search that Oleg Kisilov came up with. All of those things are awesome within certain contexts. And they are decidedly not awesome in other contexts. So if your computation is finite, you shouldn't be using this sort of mechanism. You should just be doing the prologue depth for search. It uses much less memory. There's much less overhead. It's much faster. <clears throat> um, if there, if you are using a, a restricted set of mini Cameron to do actual database operations, that might correspond closer to SQL or data log. In which case you should use a totally different mechanism of solving, which is what a data log solver is used. Okay, so <clears throat> the problem is we have tied the semantics of the language. Uh, we, we, we've, we've tied the declarative meaning, the declarative semantics and the operational semantics and implementation together completely. Which means that when Greg was trying to get Barlaman to, to work and be more efficient, and he sped it up like nine orders of magnitude in some cases, you know, he had to like hack it to death. 
And he had to, you know, muck around with the search and add special arguments saying this cert, this part of the search gets this much, you know, of a weight. You know, he was doing all this stuff by hand. Instead, there's this approach. It's an old idea. Okay, so we, I've been talking to a bunch of people who do mini camera stuff and are interested. In, and we, you know, for whatever reason, I think this idea is kind of in the air among people who care about mini camera. It's like, okay, it is time for us to go back and realize that that while that little implementation got us to where we are, we are stuck because of it. Uh, that, so there have been several mistakes that we've made over the years. The first mistake I would say was in the first edition of the Reason Schemer, we tied the implementation to scheme macros in a way where we didn't understand how hard that would be for non-schemers or non-scheme experts to understand. So we say, hey, here's the little syntax rules, hygienic macros. Well, if you're not a schemer, that is so scary. And even people like David Nolan, who implemented CoreLogic in Clojure, who is a brilliant programmer, he didn't understand it. He didn't understand it until I wrote my dissertation and really went into all the details. And we heard this from many other people that, you know, Scheme has a very different approach to syntactic abstraction than any other language that I'm aware of. And so we made this mistake that, oh yeah, we'll just see here's some simple macros and they're only like five lines long. So people are gonna be hacking macros left and right. No, 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 there's like people just didn't understand the macros. They're like, what in the world is this? I, I don't know how, what to do. So what, what Jason and Dan did in the micro paper, which I think was brilliant, in hindsight, first I'm like, that's it. <clears throat> but they separated very clearly the macros from the procedural part. And as a result, people have ported micro to, you know, probably hundreds of languages at this point. It's just like a standard thing you do. Uh, so that was important to, to realize that we need to pull those apart. And, and by the way, you know, Dan and I thought for the first edition, that run interface I was showing you, that's just like a macro. There's a there's a couple of run star and run are just very, very short macros. We figure everyone's gonna roll their own interface. Here you go. Here's a macro. You know, have at it. No one changed it. No one got it. No one's like, oh yeah, yeah. Well, no. No. The only people I know who, you know, ever played around with the interface were people who had like, you know, implemented large uh, versions of mini candle. Like, you know, the the true experts were the only ones who hacked around with it. So we completely Mis uh, misunderstood, uh, we completely underestimated the difficulty people would have. And I think another problem uh, is we just, in the name of simplicity, in the name of short code, we made this tremendous mistake where we tied the implementation, which is beautiful. I mean, every symbol, every single character was thought over and bled over. Dan spent, you know, more than a year trying to remove one line of code, and then Jason convinced them to put it back. You know, so it was like, I mean, seriously, the, this implementation has been gone over and over with a fine tooth tone uh, comb, which is great. But the problem is, it optimized for succinctness and for people to be able to understand it in some sense but it did not optimize for separating the declarative meaning from the implementation and the search and the heuristics. Okay, so the, the thing that I think we've realized that if you actually wanna be clever about it, about the search, you probably need a first order data structural representation of the search tree. You don't want procedures that are you know, opaque objects that all you can do is call the procedure and get the next part of the stream. You want some sort of reified data structure. You can inspect the tree. You can manipulate the tree. Uh, you can write debuggers. You can write optimizers, program transformations, all sorts of things like that. You also probably need a compiler um, at some point, you know, so there's only a certain amount you can do with an embedding. But even, even if you are going to stick with an embedding, you probably need a first order representation. You probably just need to break out as much as possible in the way that Kowalski advocated in the 70s. And you know, Kowalski said that algorithms equal logic plus control. Okay. 
So the problem is we've smashed the logic and control together completely. And even the implement, even though the implementation is 50 lines of code, and in some sense it's very easy for people to port it, it then takes them maybe, you know, 10 years to realize, oh, that was like a bad idea though. <laughs> you know, it's like now you have to, yeah, now you have to like kind of unlearn everything to realize that, oh yeah, I, I actually uh shouldn't have done that. You know, it's fine to learn, um, but it, it really inhibits the optimizations you can make. And um, and so that's would be fair to say that they learned many can run, but did not learn the concepts by implementing. I mean, like... I, I think they learned a lot of the concepts. I mean, I you know, I, th I think if you go through either the reason scheme or especially the second edition or the the paper, um, the micro canon paper, like the micro canon paper is a tutorial reconstruction. And so you learn about why the interleaving search is important. You learn about different things, okay? In the book, we talk, you know, we walk through unification. So in a lot of ways, I think you do learn the concepts. However, what you're really learning is a specific implementation of concepts as opposed to here is a more abstract way to clearly separate, you know, like it's, you know, you learned an implementation that chose to mix the logical specification with the operational semantics. That's what you learned, okay? You learned an operational semantics, but there are many others that you could implement. And so I think the next stage is to try to take a step back from that and say, actually, we want to abstract over that. We want to give, we you know, even if we want to keep exactly the same declarative semantics. Maybe we want exactly the same semantics as mini Canon currently has, or the variants of mini Canon because we have nominal logic and a whole bunch of other variants. Maybe we want to keep those the same, but we want to abstract over how those are implemented, how the search is implemented. Different relations should be able to have different search. You should be able to have under the hood inspection of you know, the groundless of terms in a way where, as Kent Divig says, you can do an optimization, which is cheating without being caught. Okay. So you still want it to feel declarative, but that doesn't mean that you should throw away every op op opportunity uh, to prune the search tree, for example, or to dynamically reorder conjunctions, which is what happens in Parliament. The conjuncts are dynamically reordered. And that's one way that, you know, Greg was able to speed things up by a billion times in some cases. So that program I showed you, by the way, that took 10 seconds or 11 seconds, that would have taken at least a century to run with the original implementation. And so, um, yeah, so so that's the thing. And, and we want to be able to have specialized solvers and, and all that, neither program or annotations or you know, some some smarts underneath the hood to try to to figure it out. So so anyway, that's what I think is kind of the next phase of the implementation is is separating those more. And 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 there are you know prologue implementations like Chow Prolog that I think do a decent job of this. Uh, but you know you know many candidates special I think in its emphasis on relationality and some of the examples we can do. Uh, so I think. You know, I, I guess I guess here's one way to look at it. When we first did mini Canron, there are a lot of people who could run our implementation and maybe they could play around with it. Maybe they could kind of understand it. Maybe they could port it to another Lisp. In the second implement the second version of the book, or with the the reason, I mean the the micro Canron, there are a whole bunch of people who were able to port a micro Canron to a language of their choice and understand it. They were able to understand all that. They're able to do little hacks. Um, so that was great. I think it raised the level of understanding. It raised the number of people who were able to play around with things and experiment. But what we still haven't seen is large numbers of people who have the, the people who've implemented these systems playing around with the optimizations, playing around with different search strategies, playing around with those sorts of things. Okay. Um you know, so so each time we figure out a way, I think, to raise people's understanding a little bit more. Uh, but now I think we've reached a plateau for a while where unless you're a Greg Rosenblatt or a Michael Ballantyne or an Oleg or whatever, 
then you know, the, the sorts of hacks that are necessary to get good performance or to you know implement uh, alternative evaluation mechanisms is just too hard right now. And so I think that's that's the next challenge is to do that in such a way that uh, large numbers of people can can understand it and they'll they'll be able to hack on it. And you know I think I think it's important to have an influx of new people and influx of new ideas. Because you know we're not supported by, you know we're not verse, we're not supported by Fortnite, you know we're not Fortnite powered, uh, you know so uh, we we have to have to have to get people who are interested. You know we we are weirdo powered, right? You know we need need to get some weirdo nerds who are like, oh yeah, this is cool. Um, so that's uh, but that's that's what I think is sort of the next thing we need to figure out is. How to how to separate the declarative semantics from the operational semantics, and then have a way for people to be able to explore these heuristics and different search strategies in such a way that um, you know we kind of kind of get unstuck, so that you don't have to be a Greg to create a Barlaman. Like creating a Barlaman right now is seen sort of the way that Mini Cameron was seen when we still had the macros there. Like you have to be some genius to create Barlaman. But it should be the point where like everyone creates a barlaman who's interested in this. Like it should be just like a standard exercise. It's like, oh yeah, you know, here are a few optimizations, and you know, you know, just like there's mini sat, you know, you can create a sat solver and a, you know, a small number of lines of code that has a few of the 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 you know, standard techniques that are known to work well. You know, there's there's no reason you shouldn't be able to create like a barlaman. Um, you know, if if you're able to implement a micro canron. You know the the difference between that and implementing a barlaman should actually be small. Uh, right now, it's not. So, anyway, that's what I'm thinking. I don't have anything concrete to show you, but uh, you know, I guess part of this was I was using this talk as a forcing function to force me to start thinking hard about okay, what is it that we actually need? In fact, it wasn't until this rant that I <laughs> it's like actually that sounds reasonable. Maybe that's a good thing to do. Maybe maybe I need to talk to to Dan about doing a new book, a <laughs> third edition. So yeah. Anyway, so that's kind of what sucks about Men and Cameron. Um but hopefully you could do a version that sucks less. Questions? So what you just talked about, it it sounds like at a very high level, the, the classic problem of, you know, build one implementation that you're going to throw away. Mm. It, it, in the sense that, like, you built an implementation, you know, it does stuff, right? And now it sounds like you're thinking about, well, we should throw that one away, right? And build a new one because we learned a whole bunch of stuff with the old one. That, is that a fair synthesis or did I miss it? Well, I, I mean, I guess we've been doing this for about 20 years now, and we've thrown away an unbelievable number of these. <laughs> okay. Um, that's a different problem, which also is a problem, by the way. The problem isn't so much that we're throwing away a bunch of things. I mean, that's good or bad. Okay. It's more like we have a whole bunch of research prototypes exploring things like you know, higher order unification or higher order pattern matching or nominal unification or constraint logic programming over finite domains or a whole bunch of other things. And each one is its own kind of artifact that someone implemented or a couple of people implemented at one period of time using one version of the implementation technology in one programming language and they don't compose, right? So we have like 30 mini Canon variants all of which are interesting, but we don't have what I call big Canron. So that is an, another dimension that we can might go in is to have big Canron, which is, okay, let's figure out how to put all of these features into one system. Uh, now there's some tension here, which is similar to the tension in the scheme community about standardization. So I, I, I remember going through the R7, you know, I was, I was a grad student when R7, I'm sorry, what R6, when R6 started, R6 RS, R5 RS was the scheme standard. It was pretty small. Even then, some people complained it was too big. But R6, there was the need for a new standard. It was felt because no one could run code in different scheme implementations. And the process, let's say, wasn't very smooth. 
And in fact, it was so not smooth that R7 was almost a reaction or was a reaction to it where they said, okay, the problem is there are two parts of scheme. There's like the really tiny jewel-like feature that everyone loves, right? And it's great for ideas and hacking. And that's like micro you know, the tiny little thing that you can hack, anyone can implement. And then there's like, hey, people actually want to use this for real. Like they want to use it like they might use closure or common list or something. And for that, you know, the tiny 50 line implementation maybe doesn't work so well, right? Maybe you want some libraries, you know, stuff like that. So in Scheme, that tension is felt so severely that for R7, they actually broke it, the standard into two versions, a small standard and a big standard. And the small standard was finished 2013 or something. I don't know. The big standard's still going. I don't know if it'll ever finish, okay? <laughs> I mean, seriously, it's been going on a very long time. Um, and so, you know, that's, I think there's that same tension in many Canada because it is a teaching language. It started as a teaching language and, and a language for hacking up implementations very easily so you can explore just like Scheme. But there are also implementations like CoreLogic and Clojure where a, a company that was bought out for probably on the order of a billion dollars used that technology. So you know, what should it be? Should it be something, you know, um, very pragmatic that maybe has all sorts of features and optimizations? Or should it be this like tiny thing that you could teach any undergraduate and they can hack up a version in an afternoon? Um, I don't know, I guess we're trying to do a little of both. Um, so, you know, there's this big Canron, which is kind of the opposite of what I just was talking about, because that's not something you're going to have an undergrad do or a hobbyist do in big camera. It's like, oh yeah, take 30 different implementations and shove them together. Well, that's not an afternoon project. But then there's also this kind of, you know, trying to get more people into the fold. And so from that standpoint, I think more in terms of books and papers. Like, so, we, you know, we have two editions of the MIT Press book. They were 13 years apart. And each version had an implementation that had some success, but the implementations were quite different. And I can imagine, say, a third version that would be different still that would try to separate these concerns more. Um, but yeah, I mean, I mean, I guess part of it also, there's this, what I'll call the Java phenomenon. You know, okay, so I'm not a fan of Java, but mm -hmm. Java did do something that was really important, which has got people to accept garbage collection. That was critical. And if that was the only thing, and also it got people to accept virtual machines, right? So those are two things. Those are all old ideas, but they weren't really accepted as things you could use in industry for serious programming. That was like, I mean, I talked to some C++ programmers, like garbage collection, go back and do Lisp, you moron. You know, that, that was the reaction. And now it's like, oh, well, if you're not doing garbage collection, you should be doing something more sophisticated not less sophisticated. You should be doing like Rust and borrow checking and whatever, right? You shouldn't shouldn't just like it's free for all. So that was a big change. And, and I think it just takes time for people to accept ideas and learn new ideas and techniques. And industry has been very slow to adapt. And I think it's just true in general. It's, you know, these are hard things. Like logic programming has a, I think, well-deserved reputation as being very hard to understand. So over time, we've tried to, get more and more people to understand more deeply some of the core ideas but every time there's still like a limit as to you know um to to what people what, what we can under what we can explain first first of all we're learning how to explain things to people over time and also to kind of what are the ideas and you know this group when i started grad school this sort of group didn't exist there weren't functional programming groups when I started grad school. And when I was working in industry, you know, you I had to explain to people what functional programming was. They're like, what is that? I've heard of that. I, th I think I heard that's a thing. What is that? It's like when you use functions, what is that? Right. And I had to explain to me. I was like, now it's like, eh, you know, Java's got lambda, right? So the other the the landscape has also changed. So some of these ideas. You know, the, the abstraction has increased. And now, like generators, those are an accepted idea, right? Now we have verse, okay, which is some flavor of, I don't know, I don't know what to call it. I mean, they're saying it's a functional logic language, maybe, 
you know, it's, it's not what I consider a functional logic language, but maybe they will define the term, but it's like very similar to icon in a lot of ways. And so it has, has some very interesting ideas in it. So in a world where there are a bunch of developers programming Fortnite and verse, some of these ideas just might be easier to get past. Like I think over time we've gotten more abstract. So, so I don't know if it's a second system effect. I, don't, I, I think it's a little different than that. It's more like um, every once in a while, you know, we, we feel like we're plateauing either in our explanations to people or people coming into the community or our own ability to make progress. And I feel like right now we're at a plateau where, where we were making some progress and now I feel like we're kind of stuck and we're trying to figure out, well, why are we stuck? Where are we stuck? You know? So that's, I think the heart of the issue is that we had this one implementation strategy that worked really well for certain classes of problems, but it, it, it needs a lot of work to, to make it work better for other things. And, um, we're just like a, the implementation that was wildly successful kind of locked us in. Do you ever see a case where, let, let's take the case of the functional programming concepts sort of merging into the object-oriented languages, like, you know, Lambda's going into Java. Do you ever see a case where it just sort of becomes part of the standard library in some of the more mainstream instead of instead of being a separate thing it just kind of, kind of are, merges. You, are you talking about functional programming and mainstream like OO languages in particular or just more abstract things or, or logic programming or what yeah relational constraint mm. well you know it, logic programming has been around for a fairly long time, you know, I'd say certainly since the early 70s. Um, and it, it had, you know, it had this kind of weird moment in a way in the 1980s with the Japanese fifth generation project where the Japanese government and this industry consortium sort of decided to standardize on Prolog for a while. And they did some really interesting work. And, you know, they had languages other than Prolog. Um, but a lot of it, I think, was in Japanese, and a lot of it sort of didn't escape Japan. And then the funding ran out from the government, and the project kind of went away. Um, and there was like this kind of AI winner. It's sort of similar to the Lisp machines, right? What happened to Lisp machines in the in the nineteen eighties in the U.S.? You know, the same thing kind of happened with Prolog and logic programming in Japan. Um, we had custom hardware, and you know, a lot of money. A lot of high expectations, and then people say, "Well, it didn't really, really mix uh, meet those expectations." So there was a time where in Japan in the 1980s, like you know, anyone in college learning programming was learning Prolog, and it was influential. And then it kind of went away, and it seems like there hasn't been a follow up moment where you know, with functional programming, if, I feel like functional programming ideas have kind of won in that you know, it's not like object oriented programming is gone. But people, I think, accept, uh, certainly language designers accept that things like immutability are useful or they can be useful and ideas of functions as first class can be useful. So you'll, you're seeing these languages change. One change I have seen is that data log seems to have been getting a lot of traction. Maybe answer set programming will start getting traction as well. So, you know, it's part of the problem with with logic programming is that you're always skating on the edge of what's expressible in your subset of, of you know, all of logic. So it's very easy to enter something like higher order uh, unification where every problem now becomes undecidable because you have to unify, you have to say equivalence of Lambda terms, like, you know, that type of thing. You can't, you know, it's like undecidable problem. So in logic programming, a lot of the trick is to try to figure out, well, what's the restricted Part of the language you can use. Like Olin Shivers says, always use the, the most restrictive language you can get away with. You know, always use the least expressive language you can get away with. You, what you want to use, you know, because you have a lot of leverage over the most restrictive language. That's why you use regular expressions instead of writing an arbitrary Java program when it comes to that. Um, and so data log seems to be to, to have made a big impact recently. So at least a subset of logic programming 
And of course, SQL can be seen as a type of logic programming. Obviously, that's been very successful. I think that things like answer set programming will probably get uh, become more 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 popular because like SAT and SMT solvers seem to be becoming important tools more widely. Um, as far as kind of more prology mini Canron relational stuff, I think over time that'll happen. You know, you see things like generators um, in languages now. And there's verse, which is claiming to be a functional logic language. I think it is a functional logic language. It's just very, very restrictive right now. But maybe the same thing will happen to it that happened to Java, where the first versions of Java actually weren't very abstract. And then over time, the language became more abstract. So, you know, I, I guess some of my issue with looking at verse is that it seems like there are a bunch of places where they could be more abstract and, and embrace the, the logic programming part of the language more. But right now they're not doing that maybe for performance reasons. But I don't think there's anything in language design that would keep them in the future from relaxing some of those restrictions and becoming more logic programming. -y. And so if, if Verse ends up really catching on and over time, if it becomes more more relational, then I wouldn't be surprised if people copy that. Um, but right now, I don't see a whole bunch of of these features showing up in most languages. Verse, you know, that's why I got interested in Verse. Verse was like the first language I've seen that was supported by a major company that claimed to have logic programming in its, you know, paradigm since the 1980s, I think. That's V-E-R-S-E. V-E-R-S-E, -E yeah, that's from, uh, yeah, that's from Epic Games, the people who do Fortnite and all that. And so, you know, and, and it has to interoperate with C++. So there are some pretty strict demands on what they can do. Uh, but the idea is that, you know, this is part of the metaverse and they want to be able to have strong reasoning and strong guarantees about what sort of things are allowable that you probably couldn't get with C++ directly. Um, and so they have this interesting rewrite based semantics, formal semantics are based on rewriting. They had this kind of weird confluence proof, like a church Rosser uh, type confluence proof where they have to have a modified notion of confluence. But that was like the big innovation from a programming language standpoint in terms of the formal stuff, like at uh, Popple in Boston, um, they presented, like last year, they presented uh, you know, the, uh, the semantics that have this rewriting system. So that's kind of cool. Like they have this, you know, uh, combination of functional logic language of a rewrite semantics that they can prove confluent for some definition of confluent that's tied into a major ecosystem and is sponsored by a multi-billion dollar company. And, you know, the, 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 the uh, head of the company, you know, was the one who wanted the language. So, you know, this is this is very different. This is uh, you you don't see this very often. So maybe this will be a language that has a big influence over time. I think it's too early to tell. Um, but you know, if it becomes wildly successful, and you know, or even if it doesn't, it's like high enough profile that uh, language geeks might study the lessons very closely, and so you might start seeing. Um, some of those features in other languages. I will say that I think the language design is very conservative in some ways compared to, you know, like Prolog or Mini Canron, the, the the pure subsets. And I think the reason is, you know, they they want to make sure that, um, first of all, they can deal with the effects and mutation in C plus plus, okay, and also for performance reasons. So, I think they've been kind of conservative there. But I wouldn't be surprised if over time. Uh, they relax or they add alternative operators. Um, right now, they have a list-based semantics, for example, uh, for a lot of their operations. I think they could go to a set-based semantics and in some cases. Uh, they do left-to-right evaluation of everything. Um, I think they could go to a non-deterministic evaluation in some cases. So yeah, I don't know. I mean, uh, we'll, we'll see what they end up wanting, but... Um, it is, uh, you know, the first time I've seen functional logic language touted 
uh, in any commercial prospects, even even if you disagree with what functional logic programming means. I guess you know it also reminds me a little bit of um, looking at it. I, I had a little reaction that I had when I first saw Closure, which was, "Oh, great, a new Lisp! I'm so excited. Let's see, uh, let's see about the tail recursion. Oh, no tail recursion." Let's see about the hygienic macro, no hygienic macros. And I'm like, put it back on the shelf, right? But that was that wasn't a fair reaction because you know what Rich was trying to do was different, right? And he was trying to live in this ecosystem. And so, you know, my reaction of verse was excitement followed by extreme disappointment. <clears throat> but I think it's sort of like my reaction to closure, where it's like, okay. They are trying to solve a certain problem in a certain ecosystem with certain constraints that they can't change. Um, and in that standpoint, from that standpoint, maybe it makes uh, perfect sense. Um, and it also may have the longer term effect that people start looking at constraint logic programming, or sorry, functional logic programming and constraint logic programming more seriously again. So over time, it might be kind of the Java moment where it's like, well, Java got a couple of really important ideas into people's minds. And you know, now you don't have to make the argument, assuming versus a success, you don't have to make the argument, well, functional logic programming will never be efficient. It's like, well, Fortnite's using it. So shut up, right? I mean, that's the, that's the thing that Java gave you. It's like, well, garbage collection is too slow. It's like, well, you're using that website that's, using, that's written in Java. You know. So, so I have to say, I'm, I'm I'm quite upset that like you've made it so I can't yell at my children to stop playing Fortnite now. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can tell them to stop playing it, but they now they need to start programming it. <laughs> so when you're saying that Fortnite's like Metaverse type thing, what does that exactly mean? Does that mean that you guys have to communicate? Like, how much communication is happening? In Fortnite, is it intended to be like a? Well, okay, so I, I should be careful here because I also don't, <clears throat> I don't understand all the details. You should watch, you know, I mean, th there was a talk um, by both Simon Payton Jones and um, <clears throat> oh, Epic Games. Uh, I'm totally blanking now. Uh, Tim Tim Sweeney, Tim Sweeney and Simon Payton Jones gave a talk at I uh, at Popple. Uh, last January in Boston, where they talk about this in some detail. And my understanding is that it's already being used, versus already being used with Fortnite in conjunction with C++. That's my understanding. Okay, I, Don't quote me on this, because I haven't used it in anger. And then the other part was that longer term, the vision is metaverse-based, you know, like Neil Steven, Neil Stevenson, uh, Snow Crash, you know, metaverse. Um, everyone wants to have their metaverse now. Apple wants to have something kind of like a metaverse and, you know, meta does and obviously, you know, everyone else does. So it's something like that where obviously there's going to be some big economy and it's probably going to have, you know, virtual reality and games and all that. And what Tim Sweeney wants is a system where you could have a million concurrent people on the system and they're communicating and they're trading and there's economies and all that and people are trying to you know rip each other off and you know rip off the system and do all the things that people do in big systems with economies and the system would be resistant to that because we are not going to have the same <clears throat> set of bugs that you would have if you wrote a big system like that in C++ where it's whack-a-mole instead you have this well-grounded semantics and the rewrite semantics and confluence proofs and all that. And you could do formal verification and you know all sorts of things that would be sophisticated so that the underlying system would be rock solid and you could have guarantees. That's my understanding of the long-term vision. I don't know how that really fits in today with what has been deployed, but I, I have heard that there are people right now programming in verse with uh, Fortnite. I just don't know the details. And I've, I've thought about diving into it. The, the, other, the other language that's interesting, I think, is um, the, the language icon, um, I-C-O-N. When verse came out, you know, I, have, I expected functional logic. I expected it to look like the language curry. 
if you're familiar with the Curry language, or maybe like, um, you know, Mercury, the Mercury language. Those are two languages I think of as functional logic. And to me, verse looks very different. Uh, it looks closer in some ways to Icon. Now, Icon has a very interesting model. So uh, I think some of the Icon ideas getting into you know people's minds. And it, as far as I could tell, like the verse people didn't really think of Icon when they were designing the language. And then people pointed out to them, actually, you know, a lot of these ideas look very similar to Icon. So I think Icon uh, is a language full of interesting ideas. I recommend if you're you know, a language geek, you check out Icon and and then take a look at Icon, take a look at Verse, and see if they don't look very similar to you. Um, but yeah, I can't. I can't speak as to exactly what what the long term Epic strategy is. I mean, Epic seems like they're in lawsuits every two seconds, also, and and then there's like some big investment. Yeah, who invested in them? Someone wants to invest like a gazillion dollars. Like someone's going to invest a billion something. I don't know. They're in the news a lot, but I, I don't. I don't actually care about that. I care about the PL stuff. It's like I just oh. want Fortnite, you know, inspired uh, logic programming popularity. <laughs> you know, like, so every time so you get like a, what you know, I don't know, DLC or something, you know, maybe, maybe that's uh, one step forward to having Mini Canron, you know, take off. All right. So, so I want to. Um, we're, I'm looking at the time. Um, I want to. Um, Thank you. And then I want to stop the recording and we can keep talking for as sure. long as people want to talk. Um, but this was excellent and uh, kind of mind blowing for me. Um, some other people here are saying yes, this is, this is, this is really mind blowing. Um, so thank you so much. This was, this was a ton of fun. Um, All right. Well, thank you. This was fun for me too. So thank you very much. Um, um, Ahmed, if you stop the recording, we can ask our other questions. Um, okay. Or ask other questions, guys. Just show the uh, the um, yeah, yeah, QR yeah, code yeah. just so folks can. Uh, yep. So let me stop the recording. Okay.